Hello and welcome. I'm Jeunesse Castelgate, VP at Clarius. We're excited to host today's dynamic session featuring Dr. Boyson and Dr. Shaloub. Welcome to our live webinar, Veterinary Focus, Understanding and Diagnosing Lung Consolidation, It's Easier Than You Think. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Vet Show and NAFC for inviting you all to join us here today. You're among 2,800 doctors of veterinary medicine who registered for today's popular educational event. Today's webinar is race approved, thanks to the Vet Show. So please do stay on for the full session to qualify for one CE CPD credit. If you participate for 15 minutes or longer, you'll receive an email from the Vet Show in the coming week to redeem your educational credit. At any time during today's webinar, you can use the questions box. Dr. Boyson and Chaloub will be available to answer questions during the live Q&A session following the presentation. Combined, they have published more than 25 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on the subject of veterinary lung ultrasound. So we're very excited to have the experts for today's webinar. They'll be showcasing pre-recorded canine exams to help you hone your ultrasound techniques. And following their presentation, you'll see live scanning with sonographer Shelley Gunther and our furry supporting character, Mountain. But first, let me introduce you to your host. Dr. Frankel is trained in emergency medicine in California. A passionate POCUS educator, Dr. Frankel has been using point of care ultrasound his entire career. He practices in a busy academic teaching hospital in Vancouver as an emergency physician and serves as chairman of our medical advisory board. Hi again, Dr. Frankel, welcome back. Thanks, Janice. It's good to be here. Uh, and very interesting to do a talk on a topic that uh, is very near and dear to me in the human world. And I love to see it uh, performed in the veterinary world and see the comparisons and the differences. Um, to set the stage on pulmonary ultrasound and how useful lung ultrasound really does perform in the veterinary practice, we reviewed a few studies. The first one I wanted to highlight was how it works in undifferentiated patients. This prospective study looked at 200 dog and cat patients with dyspnea, and it showed a very high accuracy in differentiating between cardiogenic pulmonary edema, pneumonia, and lung neoplasia, um, which really helps to set the stage on next level testing and how to initiate treatment in your patients that are having dyspnea. The next study was a paper more performed in the clinic environment on small animal patients who presented with lung parenchymal and pleural disease, which also found ultrasound to be a very useful adjunct in predicting again the diagnosis, this time specifically of neoplasia or pneumonia. And we'll get more into the details on how to differentiate the causes based on the findings that get identified. And then the last paper is a real clinical, uh, clinically relevant and focused study, which was a lung ultrasound in a prospective observational platform. And it showed really similar power to what we have seen in the human literature, which really demonstrates a very favorable diagnostic power in patients with dyspnea, particularly in detecting pneumonia compared to a uh, more standard state of the art using chest X-ray and CRP. And there are very specific signs that we'll get to in this webinar on how to better identify pneumonia and quickly relate that it needs to be treated or further addressed in the downstream management plan. So before we go any further, I want to just bring this quick poll to you guys. We have practitioners from around the world at different levels of practice. How frequently are you using ultrasound to image lungs in your patients? Let's see, this is gonna be a quick one. Is this something where you're just learning today? Are you rarely using it? Or is it already integrated into your practice either monthly, weekly, or even on a daily basis? And since it's quick and easy, we'll close it out pretty fast here. Let's see where are folks at. Okay, so we have most of our users, maybe two thirds kind of in the early spectrum of adoption. So that's great. Um, we can't think of any better guests to bring back than some of our favorite veterinary speakers. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor always to introduce Dr. Cern Boyson and Serge Shalou from the University of Calgary, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Boyson is a specialist in veterinary emergency and critical care, while Dr. Shalhoub is a specialist of veterinary internal medicine, small animals. They're both recipients of numerous teaching and speaking awards and considered pioneers of veterinary point of care ultrasound, having introduced the veterinary profession to the FAST exam through the original study published in 2004, and having a combined total of over 25 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on the subject. My pleasure to hand it over to you, Drs. Cern and Serge. Hello, and thank you so much, Ron, for that great introduction. And hello, everyone. Welcome. We're very happy to be here with you. All right, Dr. Boysen, how are you doing today? I'm good. Uh, and I am CERN. And I'm Serge. And we're here to talk to you about the World Cup of Soccer. Well, no, not quite. Uh, there is a game tomorrow. And uh, for those of you that are huge fans, uh, we will be watching the game tomorrow as well. But no, today we're going to talk about 
understanding and diagnosing lung consolidation because it really is easier than a lot of the other things we do with point of care ultrasound. That I have to agree with you for once. For those who have heard us, Dr. Boysen, they know that's a miracle that we actually agree on that. But our objectives today is review pleura and lung ultrasound. We'll take focus on lung consolidation specifically. Absolutely. And we're going to describe the difference. When we look at the lung, there's only really two big things we're going to look for. We're going to look for B lines and lung consolidations. And we're going to go over the difference between those two. Yep. And then we're going to classify the different types of lung consolidation. And we're going to talk about how to make that classification work for you. And then what else are we going to do? And then we're going to talk about, of course, once you see that consolidation, we got to come up with some differential diagnoses. We're going to talk about what the underlying probabilities or possibilities are when we see that lung consolidation. Yeah. So let's talk about, because we've been here before, we've been here with Clarius and we've had some awesome sessions. We were talking about pleura and lung ultrasound. What have we done already? All right, so this is actually something you can go back and review because we have done these talks for Clarius and you can see the link here. And we did a, a discussion on pleural space and lung ultrasound, the introduction, sort of the normals and what you would find when you do lung ultrasound. And you can see that is normals and the correct sites to evaluate when you're doing the uh, Calgary Plus protocol. Yeah, and then we also introduced pneumothorax, something traditionally very difficult to um, diagnose with lung ultrasound, but we showed how to break it down into binary questions and make it easier. And we also talked about increased B lines as well. So we have talked about that. And I would encourage you to go back and review this uh, particular discussion or talk if you're not familiar with any of the lung ultrasound stuff, because consolidation is a bit more advanced, but go back and review this if you haven't seen them. And we did do uh, increased B lines in the past as well. Yep. And then lastly, Dr. Boysen, we also did another webinar together on pleural effusion, something again that you would think would be very easy to find, but we showed how you know the papers out there, the studies actually show that yeah, sometimes we miss pleural effusion. Absolutely, I think it depends on the quantity and what protocols or how we're using the probe mm -hmm. to identify that pleural effusion. But you can see that in the feline talk or the uh, differentiating primary cardiac from pulmonary and pleural space disease talk that we did for Clarice as well. So that leaves us with the last of the big pleural space and lung ultrasound problems. That is lung consolidation. That's what we're going to go through today. Yeah. So on the menu today, we're going to talk about those abnormal lung ultrasound findings. We've already talked about those increased beelines, those lightsabers. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Rays of sunshine from the heavens. And then we're going to introduce today consolidations. What are the two broad types we're going to be talking about? Yeah, we're going to try and make this simple as we always do to make this as understandable and as applicable as we can. When you're talking about lung consolidations, you can really divide it into partial that doesn't go all the way from one surface of the lung to the other and translober where it goes from surface to surface. Yeah. And then in the partial, we're going to talk about shreds and nodules and maybe introduce the topic of wedges. And then again, go and complete those translobar. But it is important to review. And that's if you go back to our previous Claris webinars, we talk how do we scan the lung and the pleural space as well, Dr. Boysen. It's important to be systematic. And we promote a not memorization protocol, counting ribs. We talk about going from border to border to border to border. So how does that work? Yeah, so again, then we always like to make sure that we do start over lungs. So we're going to start our lung and find that caudal dorsal site. Once we've got that caudal dorsal site, what we encourage people to do is scan multiple rib spaces in the dorsal, the middle, and the ventral third of the lung. So we use an S shaped pattern. There's lots of different protocols out there, but make sure you're scanning multiple intercostal spaces in that dorsal, middle, and ventral lung field. That's right. S for surge. It makes a beautiful, nice S there. I like that. And then don't forget to also include the sub xiphoid region. Why the sub xiphoid? And that's because there's a region of lung that is on midline, caudal to the uh, lung surface that you can't see when you're coming in transthoracically. So it does allow us to assess an area of the lung surface that we can't see transthoracically, only by coming through the subxiphoid and across that liver we will be able to see that caudal lung surface. Yeah, we love that subxiphoid site. You can get a lot of information there. So here we go. This is what it looks like. So where should we start to make sure we are over lung and not mistaking things for lung pathology when they're actually abdominal things? Yeah, we uh, actually do encourage people to start over lung. You can modify the protocols as you wish once you get started. Yeah. But we like to start over lung. So we start about half to two thirds of the way up the thorax, right behind that front limb. Yeah. And then from there, we're going to slide the probe caudally. And we're going to actually go ahead and play this here. You can see we'll go caudal and then dorsal. So here we are, Dr. Shalhoub has the probe over the thorax right behind the front limb. 
for just jumping a rib spaced caudal at a time until we hit that caudal border. This is the uh, curtain sign. Absolutely. And we're going to follow that up. And you can just see the plural lines right here. It's going to disappear. That's going to go up. And then we come back down until we see that plural line again. Yeah. So essentially, we found the most caudal dorsal site with confidence. And then we're going to scan that dorsal, middle, and ventral third of the lungs, pull the limb forward, and we can actually get into that axilla region and tuck the probe underneath that armpit. Yeah. So here we are at that starting point, the most caudal dorsal site. We're jumping a rib space at a time forward. You can see the plural line. We're looking for B lines of consolidation. We hit that cranial border at the front limb. We slide down to the mid thorax. We come back again caudally till we see that curtain sign a second time. So we'll see that vertical edge artifact. We talked about this previously, but there is that curtain sign right there. You mm -hmm. can see coming into our view. That's that uh, caudal border. And then what we're going to do is we're going to follow that curtain sign ventrally. So we've covered the dorsal third, the middle third. We're now following that curtain sign ventrally until we put the heart and the diaphragm in the same window. Yep. This is the pericardial diaphragmatic window. Great spot to differentiate pleural from pericardial fusion. Yeah. And we talked about that previously as well. And once we get to this site right there, you can see where the uh, arrow scoping, the red line stops. We turn the probe parallel to the ribs. Yep. So you can see that here. Dr. Schlub, he's uh, turned the probe parallel to the ribs. And we really like this because we can assess two different things here. We can assess the ventral lung, yep. and then we can slide ventrally and we can assess that region between the lung and the sternal muscles for pleural effusion or ventral pleural space disease. And we can also assess them because there's two different pathologies we're looking for ventrally, ventral lung disease, such as we see with aspiration pneumonia and ventral pleural space disease that we'll see with pleural effusion. Yeah. You know what, Cern? My takeaways from this is A, how quick this is, right? B, there's no guesswork. I didn't have to memorize anything. I didn't have to count ribs. I literally went from border to border and border. And C, how steady that person doing ultrasound was. Like so steady, so cool, Luke, right? You saw that? That was just so nice. No? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the key thing is, Cern, one of the things we want to do is when we're finding that bad sign, argh, we're looking for that plural line. When we see that plural line, we're assessing for lung sliding, then what? So this is just it. If you remember, you go back to those original uh, discussions we did for Clarius. When you put the probe on the thorax, you're going to see only that area of thoracic wall, that muscle. Yep. And then you're going to see air-filled lung, which is an artifact. So we don't actually see the lung itself. Mm -hmm. We can just see that parietal lining. You'll also see the ribs and rib shadow. Yep. So this is actually really easy then when you actually put the probe on the patient over the thorax. Yep. You're going to see one of three things if you don't have pleural space disease. If the lung's against the chest wall, we're going to see that lung sliding. We're going to assess for three things. Those three things are normal lung surface. So we'll yeah. see that lung sliding, that shimmer that we talked about in the previous podcast. Yeah. And you may or may not see those A-lines depending on the angle, but that would be normal lung surface at that probe location. 100%. And then something else you can see below that plural line are B-lines. So again, those lightsabers, zoom, zoom, zoom. Right, Dr. Boysen? Rays of sunshine oh, from goodness. the heavens. Thank goodness we're not doing this podcast again. Okay, so what's the third thing we might be able to see? Uh, and then in addition to either normal lung surface, increased B lines, we can see actual lung itself as consolidation. So we're going to come back and talk about that again. And if you do want to go back and look at those uh, increased B lines versus normal, again, we put the link here from one of the previous talks. But we're going to focus today on consolidations when we actually see the lung itself. So hold on, I got a question for you, all right? You know, I'm a big fan of those B lines. What determines when you have B lines versus lung consolidation? What determines when you're gonna get those pathologies? All right, it's an excellent question. And, and the big thing it comes down to is the enemy of ultrasound, air. If you've got the enemy of ultrasound or air in the lung at sufficient quantity, we're not gonna see the lung itself. Correct. But as that percentage of air decreases in the lung at the periphery, the number of artifacts from the lung surface, referred to as B lines, goes up in number. Mm. So if we have enough enemy or air in the periphery of the lung, yep. we will only see B lines as we develop pathology. Okay. However, if the percentage of air in the periphery of the lung drops below a certain critical threshold, yep. then there's not enough enemy, not enough air in the lung left to reflect the ultrasound beam. Sure. And we start to see the lung for what it truly is. Take air out of the lung. What are you left with, Dr. Schlup? Uh tissue and then it actually takes on a tissue appearance because there's not enough enemy left whoa 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 so you're telling me that consolidation is where i'm actually seeing true lung tissue instead of reflecting back against the enemy exactly take oh. air out of the lung you're left with soft tissue put okay. air in the lung you've got too much uh enemy too yeah. much uh artifact that's going to prevent the beam from penetrating the lung itself okay and therefore we only see b lines okay so wait, I'm getting this, but what is that magic number? Is it 99.99999 or pi or something? So it varies a little bit in the literature that you read, but if you look at the human literature, generally speaking, it's 
five to 10% error. Okay. So if I have at least five to 10% error remaining in the lung tissue, that's enough enemy that the beam can't go through. Yep. And all I'm going to see as develop, as pathology develops is those increased B lines in the lung itself. Okay. All right. So what happens if you drop below 10%? That's that magic number. We're going to say 10% for the sake of the rest of this discussion. Yep. When we drop below 10%, not enough enemy, not enough air there. What happens? The ultrasound beam will actually start to pass through the lung itself as it is a soft tissue when there's no air left in it. So wait, whatever lung tissue is, is present with almost or with little air, the, the ultrasound beam can actually go through it. So we see it. Absolutely. That is great. You're getting the hang of it here. All right. uh, I'm impressed. So You're hold on, hang hold on. I need to put up a radiograph and get a good sense of what this looks like. So here on the top of the radiograph, I can see fairly normal lung, right? You agree here? That is fairly normal looking All lung right. this radiograph. So we put an ultrasound probe on here. And what I'm going to see, this is what we call that normal surface. A lot of people refer to this as dry lung. We prefer to call this the normal lung surface. You can see lung sliding or shimmer. It tells us the lungs in contact with the chest wall. And I have an absence of bee lines. This would be normal lung. This would be uh, greater than 85% error. There's always a few interval receptor yeah. and capillaries that decrease the actual uh, air at the periphery of the lung. So it's always a ratio. Normally, normally it's more than 85%. And that's what we're going to see here. Lung sliding and an absence or maybe only one or two occasional B lines. So no lung surface pathology visible here. Correct. All right. So let's go down to the middle radiograph. And you know what? If I put on my radiologist eyes or just my internal medicine, I'm like, oh, that looks a little hazy, right? You know, that hazy pattern, that's likely an interstitial pattern there. What am I going to see here when I put the probe here? Well, in this situation here, we're starting to develop pathology at the periphery of the lung. So the percentage of air is decreasing. It falls yep. below 85%. Okay. As it falls below 85%, the number of artifacts, the number of beelines increases in number, yep. but we still don't see the lung itself because we have enough enemy present in the lung. Therefore, it's greater than 10% air, but less than 85%, we're going to see those increased beelines. So that's where you see Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader. Zoom, zoom, zoom. I mean, look at that. Come on. Rays of sunshine. Yeah, I don't know. Rays don't move that fast. Okay, what about down below? Ooh, that looks nasty there, Dr. Boys. And that's a lot of schmoo in there. I think Oran would agree that's a medical term, schmoo. But look at that Shoot. alveolar pattern there. What is that going to look like? So, and that's just it. When we get to this point here, where we start seeing an alveolar pattern on our radiographs, we're offering less than 10% air remaining in the lung tissue itself. Yep. Therefore, the ultrasound beam starts to go through that lung like it's a soft tissue. So we start to see those consolidations forming. So you can see it's a really wow. nice uh, transition from healthy lung where we got lung sliding, and A lines or an absence of B lines to increasing B lines as the percentage of air falls below 85%, but we still only see B lines if we have enough enemy there. It's more than 10% at the periphery of the lung. Once it falls below 10%, pathology is bad enough. We see the lung itself. So I think I need a better clinical context. Let's take a dog, comes in, was vomiting, 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 then becomes dyspneic and tachypneic. Good scenario? Great scenario. All right, let's put on the probe and to be clear, everyone, Dr. Boysen took about 18 months to, to make this, I think, right? So it did take a little while. You see, there's a video up here where we got the uh, probe on the actual dog that we have uh, in this image here or this video. Yeah. This is the radiograph from that. We're going to put an ultrasound probe on the radiograph that's going to move from the caudal dorsal to the ventral region. Yep. And as we move across our patient on the radiograph and the dog, you'll see the equivalent lung ultrasound finding down here on the bottom right. All right, let's do it. So here we go. Fairly normal lung caudal dorsally there. I don't see any B lines, no surface pathology. Oh, maybe one be a line there not a big deal and then whoa mid thorax whoa look at all those beelines 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 but still look at whoa 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 ho uh, 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 uh consolidation uh. Let's play that one more time just so that we can actually make sure everyone's on the same page. Jeez Louise. Normal air to lung. We're seeing lung sliding, maybe one B line. As the percentage of air decreases and we're moving into regions of pathology, B lines start to become visible. They increase in number, but we only see B lines until less than 10% right there. And then it's consolidation. Wow. Sure. I got to ask you a question. Let's go ahead and play it one more time here. And here we go. When we get to that cranial ventral area, if, if I blinked and didn't see where the ultrasound probe was, I would have thought that you were over liver. Correct. Because if you take air out of the lung and you have just tissue left, the tissue that actually remains has a similar echogenicity to the liver. That's why we often refer to this as hepatization, hepatization. of the lung, because it takes on an echogenic appearance, really, that's very similar to the liver. You know what else I noticed, Dr. Boysen? As we were dropping, that pleural line became thick and irregular. Can that potentially tell us anything? 
Absolutely. And this is, again, we haven't done this uh, research on the veterinary side, but we're starting to see preliminary evidence of it or support of it. This is a, a paper that was done uh, or up on the human side. This is pulmonary respiratory and pulmonary medicine 2016. Okay. And you can see they come up with three different categories here. Yep. Acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, acute lung injury or respiratory stress syndrome, and interstitial pneumonia. Mm -hmm. We see the first two in our veterinary patients. We probably really would change the interstitial to aspiration pneumonia. Otherwise, it's going to be very similar. And if you look at the clinical course of the disease here, yep. you can see it's pretty acute in all three cases. It yep. can be. And if you look for the B lines, you can see that we got multiple B lines with edema uh, due to cardiac hygienic origin. Yep. You can see multiple B lines that are scattered with acute lung injury. And you can see a heterogeneous, but uh, often more near the base, especially in our veterinary patients as well with aspiration or in humans with interstitial pneumonia. Okay. But you can see that it's pretty acute. You get a pretty diffuse uh, distribution of B lines. Yeah. But this is where it gets interesting because these often overlap. We look at pleural surface morphology oh. and subpleural consolidations. And if you look at this, then you can see that with cardiogenic edema, our lung surface is smooth and regular with an absence of consolidations. Interesting. So wait a minute. If I go back to that previous case we just showed and we knew it was aspiration pneumonia, that makes sense because it wasn't acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Correct. So when we see more inflammatory causes in general, such as acute lung injury, aspiration, or in humans, interstitial pneumonia, then we start to see a thick and irregular pleural line. And we also start to see consolidations forming just below that pleural mm. line. So we sort of move from what would be considered a cardiogenic uh, smooth border with lots of B lines at that yep. pleural interface versus a thick and irregular pleural line uh, with consolidation starting to form. Hold on, we should ask Oron. Oron, is this something that you see when you do lung and pleural space ultrasound? Yeah, I would say we do. In humans, the same. That's really cool. Like, I feel we need to do the study now. Yeah. So that research still needs to be done. There's some people that are working on it. Preliminary, we should hopefully see the results soon. But let's go ahead and take an example then. We'll look at this here and say we've got three different patients. And I'm going to ask you, since I can't ask the audience uh, very easily, we don't have the poll set up here, but I'm going to ask you, if you looked at this, that first patient on the left, yeah. is that pleural line, let's go ahead and show that here, uh, mm -hmm. this pleural line, is it smooth and regular or thickened and moth-eaten? What do you think? Well, I think that's very smooth, Dr. Boys, and that looks very smooth to me. I don't see any irregularities, and I certainly don't see subpleural consolidation. Correct. But you see lots of B-lines. Lots of B-lines. All of them have lots of B-lines. Excellent. So all three of these have lots of B-lines. The middle one, what do you think of that pleural line in the middle one, Dr. Um, that's very jagged and moth-eaten, Dr. Boysen. Yeah, so it's getting thickened and irregular. It's not a smooth, mm -hmm. perfectly white line like no. you see in the first case. Starting to show some moth-eaten irregularities to it. Yeah. And what about that third one to the right? Well, that one, look, at. there's almost a divot there in that pleural line, Dr. Boysen. That's a subpleural consolidation. That's a partial subpleural consolidation. Excellent. So now if we applied those same criteria from the human literature to these three veterinary patients, you would say that the odds are the two on the right are going to be some sort of an inflammatory process, whether it's ARDS or aspiration pneumonia. The one on the left would be probably more a hydrostatic pressure increase, such yes. as cardiogenic pulmonary edema versus inflammatory causes. 100%. That's when I would go look immediately at that left atrium, Dr. Boysen, to see what's going on. And of course, evaluate the whole patient and the history. But yes, I would concur. Well, let's go ahead and give an example. Chloe is a real case. Look at this beautiful golden. Looks a little sad. The owner came in because Chloe was 80 are essentially with maybe an occasional cough, but just wasn't right. Isn't that correct? Absolutely. And when it first came in, I thought, oh man, it's a golden. It's uh, coming in with a very vague history. It's no, breathing normally. Don't a say cough, it. I thought we should send it to internal medicine because it's a golden. I have don't say certain it. pathologies. I won't say don't it. say it, but there's certain pathologies I worry about. Don't say so it. this patient came in. I thought, oh, this is probably not going to be overly exciting. I'll okay. send my student in to take a look. Okay. Let's go ahead and do lung and pleural space ultrasound. Whoa. Not exciting, Dr. Boysen. Look at those B lines. Definitely increase in number, like at least five on that right one, and probably at least four or five that I could see on the left one. That's a lot of B lines. That's alveolar interstitial disease. Ooh. Absolutely. So my student said, I've got some B lines here, actually. They came to me and said, We've got some rays of sunshine uh -huh. from the heavens. Yeah, I'm sure they said that. That's exactly what the student said. No. Come see this, Dr. Boyce. So I went out and looked and I said, Yeah, there's definitely some pathology going on in the lung here. We can see yeah. that at the lung surface where the probe is. Yeah. And then I asked them, Well, actually, there's something here that also worries me. And I talked to the student about this as well. What else do you see in addition to that nice, smooth pleural line and those B lines, those rays of sunshine radiating off the pleural line? What else do you see? Well, almost like a little golf divot, Dr. Boysen, on that pleural line. It looks like there's a piece missing. Like I've seen you golf and how bad you are and how often you hit the ground. That's what it looks like, a little divot in that pleural line. All right. So we can see that there is actually some irregularities here. And that worries me. So we decided to do a more comprehensive assessment of the lung surface. So we scanned a larger area of lung surface. And here's what we saw on some other sites. What are we Ooh, seeing here? Well, speaking of golf, that looks like a golf ball that's stuck in that pleural line. That's not good. That looks like a 
partial consolidation, Dr. Boysen. It's very smooth. We're going to get to that, but that looks like a nodule. Yeah, so we're going to come back to that mm. in a little bit, but this is exactly what we saw. And when I saw this, I said, oh man, this isn't good for the golden. I'm thinking that we got some sort of a nodular pattern. So yeah. same differentials that we see on a radiograph. So I thought maybe we should get some radiographs, take these to the radiologist, then talk to uh, working them up with some aspiration of those nodules. I'm sure you take radiographs on this dog and already know in the breed, all you're going to see, unfortunately, is metastatic disease. And here we go. Oh, Dr. Boysen, the radiologist read that as age-related normal interstitial pattern yes. what so we did have this read out by our board certified radiologist and it just goes to so yeah different modalities to try and pick up the same pathology in this situation here i was trying to imagine that there were uh nodules present here but Absolutely. every time i showed him something that might have been a nodule it was either a vessel something underlying the ribs there was no evidence of neoplasia or metastolic disease on either one of these radiographs according to our bird certified radiologist this is an age-related interstitial pattern. Hold on, that's not a nodule right here, this big thing? So that would be the heart. Oh, We've got a ways to go yet, but nice try. Okay. Uh, there is no obvious evidence of neoplasia here. Let's so CT it. We did exactly that. We did a CT after we did the original radiographs because, again, I went to the radiologist and said, look at the ultrasound. There's definitely nodules here. So we did the CT. You can see that on the CT. Oh. You can see multiple nodules. Those that reach the lung surface, like the green arrow. We see them with ultrasound. Those that don't reach the lung surface, the red arrow? Wouldn't see them. Correct. But this case here, we had a Man. disease process that we could identify more easily with ultrasound than we could with radiographs. So again, the two modalities tend to be complementary. Well, would you have done the CT scan without the ultrasound in Chloe? That's a good question. You know, I mean, again, our ER doctors tend to do lung ultrasound on triage. So if that patient came in three ER, that patient would have had lung ultrasound to begin with. If that patient would have come in for suspected neoplasia to the oncology service or maybe staging, they would have just gone to CT likely. And unfortunately, a big problem, this person, this owner did not have financial concerns. But if this patient had financial concerns, then absolutely we would have done the ultrasound and not the CT to start with, yeah. just because of the cost difference between doing a CT in our veterinary patients versus yeah. uh, ultrasound. So this was an, an example where it really did help us do the ultrasound first. Yeah. Good question. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, but that actually raises a great question here. So the, the green arrow, we visualize that on lung ultrasound, but that red one, there's air between that nodule and the lung surface, Dr. Wiz, and we wouldn't see it. So is that a problem? Are we going to miss a ton, a ton, a ton of pathology with lung ultrasound? Well, let's come back to the human literature again. If we look at the human literature and we look at the things that we try to detect with our lung ultrasound, we're looking for consolidations and B-lines. Yeah. And the reality is, if you look at the human literature, 95% of human pathology that will cause either the formation of B-lines or lung consolidation mm -hmm. will reach the lung surface. Yeah. So if it's bad enough that it's going to create those lesions, those lesions will usually reach the lung surface 95% of the time. Okay. Therefore, lung ultrasound tends to still be very, very sensitive at picking up pathology once it starts to cause changes in the lung itself. Okay, so we have an x-ray on the left there, and I see some pretty significant alveolar interstitial disease. If I put the probe on there, chances are I'm going to see beelines there, as we can see over there. Absolutely. But keep in mind, again, then, there are occasions where... As isolated pathology, if we have, like, for example, the case here, a cat that's got a nodule in the lung, we got a yep. pulmonary nodule here, doesn't reach the lung surface, mm -mm. not associated with metastasis, this lesion here, what's separating it from the lung surface? Air, which is an enemy. Exactly. So you put the probe on this patient here, you may not see that consolidation if it does not reach the lung surface. All we're going to see is that lung sliding and an absence of pathology. So again, we find it 95% of the time, according to human literature, we will yep. see that pathology, but keep in mind, there could be things that are isolated within the lung that don't reach the surface, separating that pathology from the surface by air, in which case we're not gonna see it. Yeah, so just like when we talked about the beeline lecture, lung ultrasound is a surface imaging technique. Very important to remember. Now let's go ahead and come back to those lung consolidations. There are three criteria, three that are important for diagnosing them. The number one is that they should arise from the pleural line. Absolutely. Like we just said, if it doesn't reach the actual lung surface, which would be the pleural line in contact with the chest wall when the lung's yeah. in contact with the chest, we're not going to see it. So it's got to arise from the pleural line. Yeah. And then the next one, it should have a tissue-like pattern, similar to the liver, which we've already talked about. Take air out of the lung. You're left with soft tissue. That's when we actually start to see it as consolidation. And the other one that really helps us classify the different types of consolidation is that distal boundary. Does it go surface to surface 
or is it partial? And if it's partial, what are the characteristics of that partial lung load consolidation? We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. So let's come back to criteria number one, should arise from the pleural line. It's got to reach the lung surface. As an internal medicine specialist, I have an incredible imagination. Would you agree, Dr. Brady? I would agree. You have quite the active imagination. Yeah, thank you. So I'm looking at this still ultrasound image here, and there was the pleural line up there, Dr. Boysen, and then down below, you know what? If I put on my imaginoscope and really pause for a sec, you know what? I can convince myself that there's a big old ugly nose tipped mass down there. Look at that beautiful nose there. And I'm sure that that's the problem. There's a nose foreign body or nose cancer in this dog. All right. Again, quite the imagination I'm impressed. But let's come back to criteria number one. Does that perceived nose lesion reached the pleural line, Dr. Shalhoub. Mm, no, it does not, Dr. Boysen. It was below that pleural line, not even contact that pleural line. It is not real, Dr. Boysen. So what was it? So this is, again, just like when you're thinking about the diaphragm, we can get a soft tissue air interface, particularly when it's got a curved surface to it, causes a mirror image. And you can see that we've got little, uh, what looks like mirrored vessels below the pleural line, the reflection of what's above the pleural line. And the easy way is to think of this is, if you have lung against the chest wall and it's air filled and it's sliding, we get that lung slide or shimmer. Yep. If you see lung sliding or shimmer, it means you've got air filled lung below the pleural line, below that region where there's a shimmer, and therefore you will see mirror image artifact. Ah. So I always say to people, if you see a really nice white shimmer at the pleural line, the spot directly below it's going to be mirror image not consolidation. So don't interpret things below that floor line when you see a beautiful white shimmer. So it's important to remember that air is an enemy of ultrasound below that pleural line is air, Dr. Boysen. Absolutely. Unless exactly like you said, we have consolidation yes. or pleural effusion, for instance, and we have something right, separate. You can't see through soft tissue air interfaces. Mm -hmm. If you get a soft tissue to soft tissue because there's no air in the lung, you lose that lung sliding or that shimmer at that uh, pleural interface. Well, let's go again and give an example here of a partial lung consolidation. So let's go back to Chloe. Ooh, that looks like a partial consolidation. That looks like a nodule, Dr. Boysen. And again, it reaches that lung surface. Absolutely. If you look at it, soft tissue to soft tissue, we're going through, there's no soft tissue air interface. Mm -hmm. So there's no lung sliding or shimmer here. It's just a soft tissue to soft tissue until we get to air filled lung down here. Yeah. So this is a real pathology. It originates at the pleural line. We've lost the shimmering between the actual consolidation and the chest wall, which we classically see with consolidations. Uh, and it moves with lung sliding. It's moving back and forth respirations, yep. which makes sense because it's originating at the lung surface within the lung tissue. And therefore it moves as the patient breathes. I got to ask you, why can't that just be a pocket of pleural effusion? Ah, uh, great question. If we have pleural effusion, Pleural effusion accumulates between the chest wall and the lung surface. So it tends to separate it and cause a line of black between the two. This is within the lung with nothing mm -hmm. on either side of it. So this is, it could be an abscess. It could be fluid within the lung itself, but this is in the lung parenchyma itself, not between the lung and the chest wall, which we'd see if it was pleural effusion. All right, I got you. Okay, so let's go back to criteria number two, which is tissue-like pattern, which means that consolidations have a similar soft tissue appearance to liver. That is very interesting. And that's because when you take the air out of lung, Dr. Boysen, well, what you're left with is tissue. But you can tell the difference. What are some highlights here that we have? Yeah, so if you look at this, I think this is a great clip here. You got the chest wall, you got a rib shadow here and a rib shadow over here. Mm -hmm. Here you've got the liver yeah. and you see what's this curving away? That's the diaphragm, Dr. Boysen. Correct. You should never see the diaphragm curve away from the liver, no. except where the heart and the diaphragm come together. So this already tells me I can see that diaphragm because there's not air above the diaphragm that's preventing the ultrasound beam from striking it. So yep. this is consolidated lung. Look at the similarity in echogenicity between the two. Very, very similar appearance. What's the big difference? You see all these little white dots and lines within the lung itself, Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, Shalhoub? Yep. That is an air bronchogram. Air bronchogram. So we will see these white dots and lines in the lung tissue, which we don't tend to see in the liver. Right. Otherwise, that echogenicity can be very, very similar. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, now I can see those little white dots and I can see that, wow, that echogenesis is so similar, but those white dots and that diaphragm definitely give it away. All right. And then the third one we talked about was distal lung boundaries must be present, which are going to help us define the type of consolidation from partial to complete. So take me through that. All right. So when we're talking about distal lung boundaries, we look at it and say, does it, once we start to see the lung as tissue, does it go surface to surface or does it re-encounter an enemy 
of ultrasound, which is air below the region of consolidation. Right. So in this example to the left, you can see we've gone through the lung surface, through the uh, chest wall. We yep. hit the lung. There's no enemy. It yep. starts to go through that lung like it's tissue because it yep. is when there's no air there. Yep. And then it re-encounters a region of lung with more than 10% air yes. below the consolidation. Therefore, it's partial. Okay. Uh, so that's the first place to start. Okay. Is the consolidation surface to surface, or is it partial because we re-encounter re -encounter air, air and lung below the consolidation? Gotcha. Okay, so that's the difference com compared to complete, where you have a surface-to-surface -surface consolidation. That could be caused from different things. Absolutely. So on the left here, we got an aspiration ammonia case, and then here we see that there's no enemy of ultrasound encounter. So the beam comes through the skin, the subcutaneous tissues, the intercostal muscles, hits the lung, no enemy of ultrasound, goes all the way through it from one surface to the other. This is trans low bar. Yeah. We see that with uh, aspiration pneumonia. But if you get compressive atelectasis, you can squish the lung so badly there's no air left in it, no enemy left. What yeah. happens? You can get a uh, trans low bar surface to surface consolidation as well. Gotcha. Okay. So that makes a lot of sense. So let's go ahead and give some real ultrasound clips here, Dr. Boysen, to highlight the difference. So over here, I'm doing this. Wow. I see B lines there. There's no doubt. And then there again, that's big divot over there. And hold on. If I had to look at that, Dr. Boysen, it, it, it has to be partial because below it, I'm pretty sure I see aerated lung. Yeah. You see a new interface. You see a new transition between the area of consolidation and between the underlying uh, aerated lung. There it is. Yep. So hiding right in the here. Yep. So there's our normal interface. Goes yep. right through soft tissue, soft tissue, soft tissue, new interface, partial lung consolidation. Yeah. And, and you're right. That soft tissue actually looks like liver. Totally looks like liver. All right. Now let's look at this one over here, which I think we've kind of already done. So we might as well put it back up as well. But oof, I think there's no brain on that one. That is surface to surface, complete hepatization, consolidation of that lung up against that diaphragm. Absolutely. Perfectly uh, well described, nicely done, Dr. Shalhoub. Yeah. And like we said, you should not be able to see the diaphragm in this case, Dr. Boys. And the only place you should see diaphragm is at the pericardiodiaphragmatic window. In a healthy animal. In a so healthy if you animal. see it away from that heart, like you see here, it means you've probably got consolidation, pleural effusion, or something else that is allowing the beam to go through the chest wall and allow you to see that diaphragm curve away from the thoracic wall. All right. So break down that uh, classification a little more. We have a couple of partials that are very specific and we have a close complete. So one of the partials is going to be the shred sign. Describe that. So when we have a shred sign, if I look at this and say, do you start to see what looks like a tissue like pattern here? Yep. And do you see it go all the way through? Yep. No, it stops. There's aerated lung after. Okay. It's partial. And now the question is, do you have a very well-defined clear border between the area of consolidation and underlying aerated lung? Or is it poorly defined, irregular, and almost shredded like torn paper? It is very shredded there, Dr. Bozen. So I would call that a shred sign. Absolutely. And when we see shred signs, we often see those associated with inflammatory processes. Oh. So we see it with hemorrhage, we see it with ARDS, we see it with aspiration really? pneumonia, okay. lots of different causes, but it's a partial lung consolidation that has a poorly defined irregular border in a lot of instances. Okay. So then there's another partial consolidation, which we saw in Chloe. So again, it's partial. We get aerated lung after, uh, you know, on the bottom there. But it's important to see there, the difference is that the borders are smooth and rounded and circular there. Absolutely. So again, if we pause this one, you can see it's partial. Doesn't go all the way through. No. Nope. This time, you'll look at that nice border between the consolidation and the aerated lung. Yep. So that is a nodule that we see here. And if I look inside, this is a, another thing you can look at. It'll give you a bit of an indication. Most of the nodules or many of the nodules we see, not all, but many, yeah. are not going to have air bronchograms with them, yeah. as opposed to a shred that tends to have a lot of air bronchograms. Gotcha. Here. So something else you can look for that may help you differentiate a little bit as well. All right. So those are the two partials. And then, of course, trans low bar hepatization. That is complete lung consolidation. In this case, over here, we can see there's pleural effusion, likely the cause, or at least one of the causes of this patient's full consolidation. And we could see surface to surface consolidation there, Dr. Boysen. There is no return of air there. Correct. We're going from one surface to the other. And as you said, the pleural effusion is a big contributing factor. I couldn't tell you whether this patient has true underlying parenchymal lung pathology or not when there's pleural effusion there, because it could just be compressive atelectasis. Right. We'd need to pull that fluid out, let the uh, lung re-expand, and then reassess for the presence of pathology, because that fluid itself could cause a problem. Right. Maybe there's even, maybe there is, or maybe there is not true parenchymal pathology there. So I feel like sometimes, very rarely, I think I've seen it a couple of times, sometimes I'll see a consolidation and it looks like a cat's claw. 
All right, so you're referring to what looks like actually a triangular Prayer. pie or wedge-shaped lesion that originates at that pleural surface. That's cool. So, so this is what we call a wedge because it looks like a wedge or a triangle. Uh, you can see it over here. We actually, uh, this unfortunately is not playing as a video, but you can see mm -hmm. this is a little wedge or triangle shaped lesion here. Yeah. Uh, so whenever we see that wedge or triangle shaped lesion, one of the things we should think about is potentially pulmonary thromboembolism. Oh, okay. So when they do this in the human literature and they see those triangular shaped lesions, they go looking for deep vein thrombosis, which increases the specificity that it's truly a thromboembolism yep. because it's often associated with deep vein thrombosis. Fortunately for us and our veterinary patients, we don't see deep vein thrombosis. Right. So we look for wedge signs. If they suddenly appeared, especially if they're not near the cranial ventral region, they suddenly appeared overnight. The patient's hospitalized with immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. It's on steroids, develops some respiratory distress. We scan the caudal dorsal regions or the dorsal regions, and we see these wedge-shaped lesions. Sure. Then one of the differentials we should have for sure is pulmonary thromboembolism. Interesting. So if we have a history that fits, if it's in the distribution away from the cranial ventral regions where we see aspiration pneumonia, it's unlikely we're going to get those lesions uh, caudal dorsally with aspiration pneumonia. Yeah. Then pulmonary thromboembolism has to be on our list of differentials. Very limited, very limited uh, evidence of this. Uh, a couple of case reports that do discuss it, but not a lot of evidence yet in veterinary literature. We'll probably see more as we move forward. All right. I'll be on the lookout for that. Now, it's important to talk about that. What causes lung consolidation? What's that air being replaced by? Well, I think the most common thing is going to be fluid, right? That's the one we probably think about the most, right? It's essentially the same things that when we talk about beelines, right? Correct. But at an increased severity to drop the percentage of air below 10%, such that it causes consolidation. So we see it with pulmonary contusions, hemorrhage, for example. We see it with pus, aspirated gastric contents, other fluid types, ARDS, for example. Yeah. So we will see it, though, just like with beelines, when we have replacement of arided lung by other pathology besides fluid, such as neoplasia. Yeah, so we're talking about cells here, an increase in cells causing consolidation. So here, neoplasia, inflammatory conditions, and fibrotic. I had a case of um, eosinophilic bronchopneumonitis, uh, pneumonitis, Dr. Boys, and that case had consolidations. And we know now it was all a whole bunch of eosinophils in there, which is so crazy to me. Absolutely. So those things, same thing on a radiograph. If it causes interstitial all the older pattern on a radiograph, we can see that with ultrasound as well. Yeah. And the other thing, again, you don't even have to put pathology in the lung to decrease the ratio of air. Yeah. You can just remove the air from the lung. What are you left with? Soft tissue. Soft tissue. We can see consolidations with atelectasis. Right. Well. Okay. So I got to ask you, are consolidations bad? Like, should I even been saying that on the air? Is that a, is it bad? So it is a very simple answer. Uh, if you've got less than 10% air in the lung such that you see the lung itself, that's a problem. It's yeah. always a problem when you see a consolidation. The question the more important to ask is, is it always associated with underlying parenchymal or pulmonary pathology? What do you mean? I don't get that. So if we look at these two examples here, the one yeah. on the right that we come back to, that was the aspiration pneumonia. That's parenchymal pathology we uh -huh. see. The one on the left, this could just be compressive atelectasis. Whoa, whoa, we whoa. might not have parenchymal pathology there. Yeah, that looks so that's like a big question. That looks like a brain, an alien's brain floating in there. You're telling me that's a consolidated lung? <laughs> it does look like an alien. I would agree with you there. Uh, this is actually sometimes what they call on the human literature a jellyfish sign. We see this, yeah, this little piece of consolidated lung floating in the fluid. Yeah, it certainly looks like that. Okay, so what you're telling me is, yeah, consolidation's bad. I get it because you don't have enough air in the lung, whatever, you know, but the cause may not be as sinister as some others. Exactly. Uh. You can't tell me when there's pleural fluid there whether or not we have bad punct parenchymal disease or not. So is there a way to tell? You're looking at consolidations on pointy care ultrasound. Is there a way to tell if it's a bad, bad consolidation or just a bad consolidation? <laughs> All right. So what we'll do is, is just like on a radiograph, you can see air bronchograms. Yeah. You can see that on this radiograph here. Sure. You have this black here, which is the air and white. It's the inverse when it comes to ultrasound. Okay. So the air shows up as white and the consolidated lung shows up as black. Oh, so those white dots are air bronchograms. Correct. Oh. And we will see air bronchograms with atelectasis secondary to compression. Okay. We will see air bronchograms secondary to pathology, such as aspiration pneumonia. But hold on, sometimes I feel we see those air bronchograms actually move, or sometimes they're just little dots. So here I'm looking at a partial consolidation. That's a shred, you agree? Agree. Right? So those are all little air bronchograms. And so they're white little punctate dots. Okay, I get that. But sometimes I feel you can actually see ugh, the air bronchogram move. Is that a possible thing? 
Ah, and that's really nice. This is an example that was sent by Dr. Uh, Celine Nevero out of uh, France yep. uh, in Lyon. Mm -hmm. And you can see right in the middle of this consolidated lung, there's our liver, the diaphragm. You can see the spine. You should never be able to see the spine from the, uh, the zipoid site. But you see this consolidated lung, all these branching air bronchograms. Look at that middle of it. Right in the middle of that airway there, you can see that moving. That is a dynamic bronchogram, a dynamic air bronchogram. We tend to see that with pathology in the human literature. Oh. So you look for that dynamic air bronchogram. It tells you it's not likely consolidation. It's going to be pathology. So hold on. Static can be both, but dynamic usually indicates to something more sinister. Is that correct? Correct. It means there's pathology there. If it's static, it could still be pathology in the lung itself, but it may also be atelectasis. So and it's that dynamic that really tells us that we have parenchymal pathology. And they call that a lung worm. Is that correct? So in the human literature, they often refer to it as a lung worm. That is I, correct. I would have called that the body chop. Look at that. Hi -ya. Hi -ya. You don't think so? Uh, you can call it what you wish, my friend. Come on, karate kid. Come on. Yeah. Okay. Cobra Kai. Okay. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Dynamic is more likely pathology. Now, let's go back to one of our favorite topics, Dr. Boysen, because when we scan the lung in a big S-shaped pattern, because we want to scan as much lung as possible, that's what we do in a radiograph, right? You're not going to look at certain points in a radiograph. You want to look at every prayer. We collect all that data, put it together in a plus profile, which we'll talk about because we're going to bring up her book in a minute. But how does that look like when we're talking about consolidation disease? Exactly. So you got to map the lung. You can't just look at one isolated region or one isolated intercostal space. You got to map the entire lung surface mm -hmm. and then put together a profile or a picture of that surface of the lung. Yeah. You also have to look at the pleural space and consider whether you have pleural effusion. Like we said, could it be atelectasis or not? No pleural effusion. Now we're dealing with the lung itself. Okay. And in this example here, I look at it. If I have lung sliding in all images, yep. everything looks nice and normal up normal, here with just normal. A lines. Here, not good. There's already four B lines there. In isolation, that one there, only two B lines. That's okay. But if we're putting everything together, we get another abnormality here with increased B lines, and we move into a region of consolidation yep. with a shred sign here. What profile does this suggest based on how you map it? Well, based on that and the location of the pathology and increased severity, I would think this is aspiration pneumonia going cranial eventually, Dr. Borges. Correct. Mm. I would 100% agree. That is this patient's plus profile. Consider each window when you decide if it's normal or abnormal, but map the lung surface and go from regions of normal to abnormal to pick that picture up. All right. So let's take um, Chloe, for instance. Let's do we're doing lung ultrasound on Chloe. And, you know, she's just here for ADR. Everything's normal, 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 normal. Oh, Way down there, I see one area of lung pathology, and it happens to be a nodule. Correct. And you might think, well, this is cranial ventral. Could this be aspiration pneumonia? Sure. But then you map it. And if it was aspiration pneumonia, and you're in an area where there's a shred, you should see inflammation around it. You'd probably see B lines moving into more normal lung, whereas this is just an isolated region. This makes this more likely a nodule. So again, uh, that plus profile is very important. So you've got to add up all the individual windows, not take them in isolation, add them up. We'll take them in isolation, but also add them up. Okay, so that makes sense. All right, well, let's go ahead and summarize our lung consolidation talk. When there's less than 5 to 10% air in the lung, the ultrasound beam can actually traverse lung tissue, and that is called lung consolidation. Correct. And there are three main types of consolidation that we tend to see in veterinary medicine quite mm -hmm. commonly. One is the shred sign. So that's the regular, poorly defined transition between the consolidation and the aerated lung beneath it. Partial. And it's a partial lung consolidation. Yeah. And then another partial is going to be the nodule sign with that smooth, rounded border. And that could be metastatic cancer. Cancer could also be fungal, could also be potentially an abscess. Correct. Same differentials as you'd see on a radiograph. Yep. Again, you're using two different modalities, radiographs versus ultrasound to tell you the same thing when we're looking at B lines, when we're looking at uh, nodules, when we're looking at shred signs. Two different modalities to tell us the same thing. And the last classification that we commonly see is going to be that translobar hepatization from surface to surface that you can see here in this patient that happens to have pleural effusion. Yeah. Again, there's some newer ones coming out that uh, we don't see as commonly uh, in our veterinary patients and we haven't described as well, such as the wedge sign. These are the three big ones we tend to see classically in our veterinary patients. That's right, Dr. Bozen. And on that, we're going to end it and take questions. First, though, we wanted to point out we just published with the proud authors of a brand new book with Chris Gomerin as well, The Essential Veterinary Point of Care Sound Plural Space and Lung, Dr. Bozen. And this is out right now. Yeah, so uh, in Canada, it's uh, available on Edger Publishing. Uh, it's available through Amazon. Uh, Dot com in the US. Yeah. And Amazon Europe, I think. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, and, and the nice thing about the book is we really tried to take everything we talked about over the three sessions of Clarius and sort of summarize it in just an assessment of the pleural space and lung. 
We put all the profiles in there. We've got lots of uh, videos on abnormal curtain signs, different types of consolidations. So again, if you want a bit more than what we can provide you in the uh, lectures uh, and online here, then please go ahead and yeah. take a look at the book. Very much a how-to book. And look at that. Am I scanning your heart and I see a cat, Dr. Boyson? Is yeah. that right? <laughs> Lots of things. Again, that imagination That's years, scary. Dr. Blue, it is scary. Your That's imagination very is scary. scary. Your imagination is scary. And on that, we're going to turn it back to Oran. And thank you so much, All everyone. Right. Thank you, guys. And I'm going to encourage everyone to please use the Q&A. Uh, we already have a lot of questions, and we are going to get there shortly. Uh, before we do, we're going to hand it over to Shelly Gunther, our clinical marketing manager, for a demo. I uh, have uh, Mountain, the um, Clarius mascot here. I'm just going to do a really quick demo on how to scan the lungs and what it looks like uh, in real life here. Great. And uh, as I've learned from the doctors before, you can scan the dog in any position. <laughs> so uh, Mountain is standing here and I'm just starting kind of behind the, the front limb. And we right away can see really nice pleural surface. Nicely done. Look at that bat sign there. Increase my, yeah. And, and I love the fact that you say just kind of move with the skin over the rib spaces. And uh, I think well, there's my that. curtain First sign, time. right? <laughs> You're at the common border now, transitioning Excellent. from the thorax onto the abdomen. Beautifully done. No sure. guesswork there. And That's it, the caught border. Right. And, and if I head up uh, more dorsally uh, until I get into the back nice. muscles. Yeah. And, yeah, the back uh, and yeah. then and back, back down. down. You're Beautiful. At, back up. Point of the chest. No guesswork. Love Great. it. Nice lung sliding, a nice shimmer, no B lines, no pathology, few A lines. Beautiful. Great. Thank you. Good. So we're just mm -hmm. using this scanner, same one you guys used. And uh, I'm in a lung preset, which is a little bit more contrasty a look than you had, but uh, I don't think there's a right and a wrong. It's whatever makes sense to you. Um, so use whatever preset that you like. So I will hand it back to Aran for some uh, Q&A or maybe back to Jeunesse first and then we'll get into the Q&A. Yeah, yeah, please. Thanks so much, Shelly, for the quick demo. Yeah. And uh, please keep filling out this Q&A. We'll have time. I have a feeling we're gonna hit the top of the hour and so we might extend it an extra five minutes to make sure we get and get to as many questions as possible. Um, and I'm gonna hand it back to Jeunesse here. Thank you, Dr. Frankel and Shelly. And thank you, Drs. Boyson and Chaloub. Before we begin our live Q&A, we have a question for you. This poll is an opportunity to learn more about our third generation Claris wireless ultrasound scanners for your veterinary practice, which are now available in over 70 countries worldwide. So please do complete this poll to let us know if you'd like more information about Claris HD3 vet scanners. Do click on as many options as apply. Pricing and availability does vary by region, so feel free to request a quote and pricing. You may opt to speak to one of our experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound. If you'd like to discuss scanner features, please select that option. We can also book a virtual one-on-one -on -one demo with our experts to see the new Claris HG3 in action in an interactive session. And we can send you more video tutorials for veterinary medicine. So please go ahead and select as many options as you wish. While you take a minute to complete the poll, I'd like to tell you about our Claris VET HD3 scanners for the highest definition wireless ultrasound imaging to speed diagnosis for small, medium, and large animals. Our C7 HD3 microconvex VET scanner, which you saw in action today, is specifically designed for clear clinical imaging for small and medium animals like cats and dogs. We also have the C3 convex for larger animals like sheep and horses, and the L7 linear VET for superior animal MSK imaging often used in equine applications. Now 30% smaller, lighter, and more affordable with an enclosed battery or third generation family of vet scanners are unrivaled for high resolution imaging and handheld ultrasound with dedicated animal presets. Claire shows you the fine details you need to investigate an area of concern, perform a fast exam and make a confident diagnosis on your patient's first visit to expedite the right treatment plan. Each scanner is designed with not one or two, but eight beam formers and 192 piezoelectric elements to ensure the image quality and speed only found in traditional systems, but at a mere fraction of the cost. Artificial intelligence replaces complex knobs and buttons to optimize imaging and streamline workflows, making our scanners fast and easy to learn and use. Claris is also wireless with zero footprint for high portability to scan animals where they are from the vet clinic to their homes. You get free movement with no wires getting in the way or startling the animals, also making it faster to clean and disinfect. Only Claris delivers wireless scanners with an ecosystem that includes a free app for your iOS and Android devices with free updates. 
Available with our new membership, Clary's Cloud can be used to capture and manage unlimited exams from anywhere. Your membership also includes in-app Clary's Classroom videos with experts like Dr. Shalub and Boyson, as well as onboarding with Clary's clinicians to build your ultrasound scanning skills. And Clary's Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for a second opinion. Your membership also includes the new advanced veterinary package that offers more flexibility with additional tools and advanced workflows for various animal exams, for example, with finely tuned presets categorized by application anatomy, like the lung ultrasound you saw today. For clinicians who prefer a one-time purchase over a membership, the advanced veterinary package is also available as an add-on purchase. With increased ultrasound billings, you'll see a rapid return on your Claris Vet HD3 scanner, which is ultra affordable. I'll give you three more seconds and before we close out the poll to allow you to request more information. Two, one. Thank you for participating. We will get back to you in the coming week. We do have one additional poll for a live Q&A session. If you're not busy during the day on Valentine's Day, we'd like to invite you back on February 14th because we know you love animals as much as we do. Please click yes in the poll to register and save your seat for our February 14th webinar, Veterinary Pocus Diagnosing Canine Pericardial Effusion in Seconds. The dynamic Duo, Drs. Boyson and Shaloub, promise to educate us and keep us entertained again as they teach us POCUS skills to differentiate pericardial from pleural effusions with confidence. I'll give you five more seconds to save your seat. Four, three, two, one. Wonderful. I'd like to now begin our live Q&A session. So please use the questions icon in the menu bar to ask your questions for Drs. Boyson and Chaloub. Because this is a common question, I do want to let everyone know that in the coming days, we'll send you an email with a recording of today's live event and a link to the VET show to redeem your CECPD credit. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Frankel to moderate our Q&A session. Great. Yeah, let's jump on in. And uh, like I said, we'll go about five minutes after the hour, just make sure we can get to as many questions as possible, uh, but respect everybody's time. Okay, so first question is, World Cup of POCUS, who wins? Team Surge or Team CERN? <laughs> oh, look, there's well, no answer. Well, I that's the obvious. <laughs> I, it, CERN is the better soccer player. I got to say, I'm wearing my Canada soccer shirt today because my team is, Canada's my close second team. I'm Canadian. Close second. So you just but, said close second. There is no second. You never have two teams. France you have a team, team if you're a true fan. And he would have killed you me. You can't if have a second. What See what I mean? Second me. He's already getting Okay. okay. We're going to move on. We're going to move on. Let's move on. Um, so a lot of people want to know, uh, like for scanning, this comes up frequently for these uh, veterinary webinars in terms of like how to scan a patient. If you're doing the full yep. S on the chest, you want to scan both sides. Technically, how are you doing that? Are you like, you're, you're not clipping the, the animal, no. but are you using alcohol everywhere? Are you dousing them in alcohol? Are you squirting as you go? How do you do it? Nope. Absolutely not. So actually the Clarius video that we did um, highlights how we did it. So we actually part the fur, we wet um, the skin directly, put the probe on there, and we're initially already moving the skin forward towards the forelimb, which is the closest you can get to the cranial lung border, putting the probe there. And then the hand is moving the skin and the other hand is on the probe and moving backwards the skin. As far as it can go, you usually can get at least on a big dog, at least halfway to three quarters backwards up until you get to that uh, call to border. You might have to let go, wet an energy spot and move again. Honestly, we wet maybe three or four spots total on a large dog. Um, on a small dog, you probably get away with wetting two spots. So we just, we don't douse, we don't shave at all. Um, we just wet two or three spots and use the skin and slide from side to side and usually do them in sternal. Absolutely. So just make sure you part the first so you can see the skin. And it's just like a chest tube. When you do a chest tube, for those of you who've done that, you want to pull the skin forward and then you're going to release it on the chest tube. So same thing. We pull the skin forward where we're starting at and we can move around that spot that we part the fur quite nicely and, and get away with minimal alcohol. Yeah, exactly. A um, couple of people want to know about lung lobe torsion. Is that something you scan or do? Absolutely. So that one will have, uh, there's a degree of signalment uh, that goes with that. So we see those bugs that come in with respiratory stress, for example. We're going to look for that. We'll often see that pleural effusion is a big component of it. We will also see, and we're actually going to, uh, we're in the process of putting out another uh, textbook on clinical cases of point of care ultrasound. That's mm -hmm. going to include a case of lung lobe torsion, because we often see that what we call a starlet pattern. So we see that little speckling or starlet pattern in the lung itself. That's a little bit more 
characteristic or suggestive, more sensitive of lung torsion. But we'll often see the consolidations, the B lines, the pleural effusion, and then we may see that starlet pattern within the lung parenchyma itself. And how about, um, can you speak a little more? I know this, today's talk was about primarily around, you know, um, lung consolidation and kind of the infectious etiologies. Can you speak a little bit more about uh, the pulmonary, the, the cardiac conditions uh, presenting as pulmonary presentation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those patients based on history, we already have an index of suspicion. It's in our top differentials. You start doing lung and pleural space ultrasound, those patients should have alveolar and suspicious disease, so usually B-lines. And like we showed that human paper, it's unlikely that they're going to have, you know, an irregular pleural or subpleural consolidation. So usually the pleural line is smooth, but you usually have a fair bit of B-lines. And then the next thing we would do based on suspicion and also on physical exam, look at the heart and look for that enlarged left atrium. So you have a dysmic patient, enlarged left atrium, B lines, chances are that patient is in congestive heart failure. So that's a patient you probably want to pull out the perosomide pretty quickly. And you did all that without stressing the patient. A hundred percent agree. And it's those B lines that we look for. And if we see those, we go looking at the left atrial uh, aortic ratio. So that's right. really the order in which we'll do it, both cats and dogs. Some cats will see that pleural effusion as well. We want to rule out a congestive heart failure as the cause with pleural effusion. Again, it's that left atrial ratio. And we talked about it in one of the earlier uh, podcasts, I believe as well, uh, mm -hmm. that you can refer back to in terms of looking at that left atrium. Mm -hmm. And that pleural line, right? Which, um, you know, for the human literature, it really kind of got solidified in the whole COVID pandemic where we started scanning a lot of lungs. And that was where it got prime time about the pleural line ultrasound. Yep. It seems to kind of be replicated in the animal literature too. Yeah because you're working on that. Yeah, cool. Um, so how about when you, you were talking about uh, which position to scan the animals in, if they want to lay down and they're in recumbency, um, does that affect the scanning on the other side? Like, does it lead to lung compression? Do you get more artifact on the on that dependent lung at all? And how well, do you do with that? Yeah, good question. So as much as possible, a dysphagic decapitating patient will scan him as terminal standing. But of course, if that patient, let's say, was hit by a car, has broken hips and wants to stay, you know, in lateral, we'll scan him in there. And that's the beauty of scanning him border to border to border, because you're not going to miss the pathology. Obviously, some of the pathology you're looking for is going to change location. So if it's pleural effusion, you got to go downwards to the most gravity dependent site. If it's pneumothorax, you're going to go to the highest point of the chest. So those things don't work. The location is going to change depending if they're in lateral or in um, sternal or standing. Um, the other thing is there's no doubt if the patient is in lateral long enough, of course, there's going to be some con consolidation that you're going to have to factor in potentially. Absolutely. So we can see B-lines start to develop. We can actually start to see consolidation start to develop due to uh, prolonged recumbency that will cause or lead to uh, gravitational atelectasis. So in those situations, we can usually roll them up. If we can, if they're uh, mechanically ventilated or we've got them intubated, we can give them breaths. So it'll often improve that uh, degree of B-lines consolidation. And the other thing we talked about, we'll assess the uh, air bronchograms in those guys as well to see if they're dynamic or static. Yeah. If it's truly due to positional atelectasis, then those guys should have purely static uh, forms if the human literature applies to the veterinary patients as well. They should have static uh, air yeah, bronchograms exactly. if it's uh, positional or gravitational atelectasis. Yeah. And maybe this is more of a question for the internist, sorry, CERN, but, uh, you know, in terms of um, following through for treatment, uh, you know, how patients re respond to treatment, um, do you find that the ultrasound is predictive, useful, uh, where do you integrate it into kind of serial scanning? That's a great question. Well, it's actually a question applicable to both of us, because when we're looking at congestive heart failure, absolutely, you can literally count the B lines, right? I mean, obviously, you wouldn't do that, but it's like, whoa, you know, coalescing B lines, two hours later, whoa, look at that, you can actually see four or five B lines, five, six hours later, oh, a couple of B lines here and there. And that is actually important for the prognosis. Yeah. So in the cases of if you have fluid in the lung, or even if you have aspiration, we can follow them serially with uh, pointy carol sound. The flip side, if you have healthy looking lungs to start with, you put them on fluids. This is something that we do too. It's called the falls protocol on the human side. What we'll actually do is put them on fluids and we'll scan the lung. If it looks like there's no B lines to start with, and suddenly our patient's starting to develop B lines while he's on IV fluids. Again, that's a serial indication that that patient could be running into volume overload or fluid in the lungs itself. Yep. So we do follow them serially for sure. Uh, I would actually say that when it comes to lung ultrasound, they are more sensitive uh, than radiographs when it comes to identifying those changes in the lungs. Yeah. That's certainly what we see in the human literature for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So maybe one last question here. Oh, these are all just like telling you about what an awesome job you guys did, <laughs> which is of course, you know, that's not a surprise. Um, 
do you use the same probe when you when you do these left atrial scans or you then you scan the heart? Are you just using the same transducer and then kind of flipping over or do you have to switch? Yeah, honestly, we are. We're, we tend to use the microconvex curvilinear probe for everything, you know, especially that um, both CERN and I, especially when we work emergency, critical care, internal medicine, rarely, well, I guess me on internal medicine, I might have a little more time, but rarely do I have time to switch probes, um, especially that these patients are often coming in hot, you know what I mean? Like they're not, so we can actually do everything with that microconvex curvilinear probe. I also saw questions about cost. For us on our emergency services, it's actually incorporating that triage fee. So it's not a, a wholly separate fee. Um, so that also makes it easier for us to do. So we can do it immediately when that patient comes in along with the physical exam. Yeah, it's, it's a triage exam. It's an extension of your triage exam when you're applying that uh, probe to the patient. And I will say that although we scan everything with a microconvex probe, if we want to go a step further and we get and you're, you're uh, able to do that based on your skill with ultrasound, then certainly there are settings that you can change for the cardiac settings and there are different probes you can use. Uh, vascular access, for example, it is nice to have the linear for that. Some of the more superficial things in our cats, for example, kidneys, nice to have the linear for that. We scan everything on the emergency as triage with the microconvex. Mm -hmm. But once you get more comfortable with ultrasound uh, and your grow, uh, your experience grows and your expertise grows, then that's when going with a phased array, changing the settings can be beneficial to look for more subtle lesions. We tend to look for gross pathology that's really easy to identify, which is why we love point of care sound in the triage setting. Yep. It's so applicable across the board. And so easy to do. Great. Well, on that note, uh, perfect timing. Five past the hour. I'm going to respect everybody's time and we'll call it a day here. Thanks so much, Surgeon Cern. Uh, Jenez, you want to take us home here? Yeah, perfect. If we didn't get to your question, we'll follow up with you by email in the coming week, and you'll all receive a copy of the recording as well as an email from the vet show in the coming week for your CECPD credit. We do ask that you complete our closing survey to give us your feedback so we can continue to bring you great educational content like today. I'd like to conclude by thanking Dr. Boyson and Dr. Shaloub, also thanking Dr. Frankel, Shelley, and Mountain, and of course, thanking all of you for joining us here today. I hope you had as much fun as we did. We hope to see you all again on February 14th for our POCUS webinar on how to diagnose canine pericardial effusions in seconds. In the meantime, keep scanning, and we wish you all a wonderful holiday season. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone.